Bridges to Prosperity with Craig Stevens and Scott Walls, and they have the full 30 minutes. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, so uh, Scott's going to have to uh, PC Mr. Stevens. All right, with that, here you go. Hello, everyone. I'm back. Um, I First, I need to apologize to everybody in the front. I don't know what gets over me, but if I made fun of you, I'm sorry. And in... in and I'll t tell you how serious I am about this. I, I got a challenge coin in my pocket right here. Now, some people in here go, a challenge coin, that's silly. Only people get it. So, but I wanted to talk about, real quick, so this is why I need my whole 30 minutes, is that there's somebody in this department that has had to deal with a railway swing bridge. Now she's looking, she's probably turning a little bit red. It's called 3-928R. The R stands for? Railroad, you guys, come on, wake up. So the R stands for railroad. So what we have to do is we're talking about relocating this bridge for a local community group. What are they called, J-Dog? Railroad, railroad Junction something. So poor Alex Tarantino has had to go with us to things. And the great thing about this, and this may come off as wrong, so um, the great thing about this is they're the ones that are actually trying to speed up the process this time and, well... Jay keeps making deals with his junction group. But I would love it if, Alex, you got to stand up. I know you, you hate this, but you got to stand up. I'm looking right at you. That's Al Everyone turn around. That's Alex Tarantino. I want you to come up and get your challenge coin. Everyone give her a big hand like it's the price is right. She's pissed. <laughs> She's also wiping off her hand because my hands are all sweaty from being up here. She's probably got to go get like a, a dish rag or something. Okay. So how many people know that we went, me and Scott, this good looking gentleman to my right, went to Bolivia last year? Raise your hand if you know that. What did we do there? Does anyone know? We did not party. We did not party. We, it, we're not Jason Hastings and Kevin. Just kidding. What did we do? You, we built a bridge. Good call. But before I start, I want to tell you guys I'm uncomfortable about something. Um, if you notice, I'm going to step right next to Scott. Wall's over here. Everybody thinks he's really good looking. But I've been asking the younger guys in the bridge section how to dress. So I want to see if you think I, I nailed it. Let's see. How you like that? I'm in style. I hate it because I can see my... Oh, and they tell me to wear funky socks, so I did that too. Um, that has nothing to do, and now my pants stuck because they're too tight. <laughs> I tried skinny jeans. Awful. Awful. I will never wear them. Listen, those things tell you things you don't want to know. So, here we are. Lessons learned. So, Scott's going to tell you about the good stuff. I'm just here to complain. Basically... Uh, lessons learned at Scott and I there. Um, here's what happened here is at the end, do you see everyone dancing? Well, they all went in a circle and danced, and guess who I was standing next to? Scott. So he and I, for about five, ten minutes, danced like this, holding hands, and it was very uncomfortable. Scott is very good at dancing, um, but it was fun. That right there is a celebration when we actually, pardon me, oh, it's that one pork chop. <laughs> Woo. You get older, you know, you get, everything gets back to you, you know, you're either in the bathroom or burping, I don't know. So anyway, long story short, dancing was cool, Scott can dance, believe it or not, he can. So okay, you have to be careful with the water, now, I, I'm not sure if you can read that, but it says it was filtered, never believe that, never believe that. Now, why do you have to be careful about the water? Well, you also got to be careful about the milk, there's Scott looking... You know, I think he could work on his look a little bit better there, but he's drinking straight milk from the cow, so it's nice and warm on a nice hot day. And now, but does anyone know what the guy on the left is doing? Nobody knows. 
He's pouring milk into a bowl. How hard is it? Seriously. They actually added alcohol to the milk and called it tiger milk. So you need to be careful because they will put alcohol in everything. Um, so if you, don't, if you drink the water or you drink the milk, you end up in their public restroom areas, which is what I'm showing you right here. Now, this is a funny story. I, I thank God for Brad Dillman of High Steel. Not a plug, but he saved my life. We were out there working, and guess what? I drank the water and the milk, and someone tell me what happens when you do that. You can't, can you, Jim? You can't. You're just sitting there. What happens? So I ended up having to go to the bathroom leaning against the wall. The good news is it was a, it was a mud spackle wall. I helped it out a little bit, but here's the bad thing. All right, I'm wearing... I'm wearing my, you got to wear your, what do you call those damn things? The vest. I'm wearing a vest, and it's all bright with my hard hat on. And, and I'm sitting there, you know, doing what I got to do. Number two, if you're wondering, Rob. McClure. Yeah, I got to tell you something funny about Rob. He walks right to someone right behind me, and he, I was standing right here. He goes, hey, to the other person, hey, good job on your presentation. Walked right past me. <laughs> I thought we were friends. Anyway, so... Here, as I'm sitting there, these gentlemen start walking up. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's awful. I'm just sitting there. I don't know if this ever happened to you before, but I was making noise. And I quickly grabbed my hard hat and my safety vest and threw it so they couldn't see me. I don't know if they noticed anything going on, but they literally did walk right by me. And uh, so lesson here that you're learning is be careful with the water. And that travel ban stuff they give you doesn't work. Um, okay, utilities. Can you, can you guys see how many utilities are on this poll? Let's just say, say a lot. Now, this was our utility section. No, you guys do a great job. I'm not going to say anything bad about you. But uh, I just thought it was weird that uh, everything's overhead. There's probably like 50 wires on this. So, uh, and here's something that I learned, too. I'm very grateful about. This was Scott and I's. Scott and my. Scott and Shantae. What's the right grammar there? Me. Just keep going. Okay. Me and Scott. Scott and I. This was how we got to work every day. Um, we literally drove down the river. The good news is silt fence was not up. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see our CCR inspectors out here on this job. <laughs> So here's why we did it. Isn't this a cute little picture here? In all seriousness, it's Miguel and Alejandro. And this is, they're two guys that lived away from the city, okay? This is his parents, okay? So they live in a small farm. It's like a mud hut kind of, in my, I'm not selling it too much, a mud hut, one bedroom type thing. And every day they've got to take a commute to go to the city to go to school or go to the hospital. So these nice people, he, he's a liar, but what he, I'm being kind of funny, but he told us my house is right around the corner. First of all, there's no corners, we're in the, but, and we walk forever. And then to top it off, we got the hot milk. So there they are, and this little kid right here was so funny, he would swing at these long horn things and the, the cows would get right out of his way, man, it was great. He's, he's a tough little cookie, this little guy, well you can't, whatever. So here we are, they, they, they made milk from the cow, which was warm. Did, my, did you just go dead? Huh. I'm dead. Hold on. No, 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 the monitor's dead, so I have no idea what's up on the screen. So I'm going to have to look at you here. There's Craig with his smiley cup. You see that? Um, they brought us milk and homemade cheese and corn. Um, look, he's trying to... They, these young guys think they know everything. <laughs> hey, it did come back on. <laughs> That's embarrassing. But how do I do? All right, whatever. Okay, he's better than I am at this. So anyway, moving on. Um, here's, their, here's their commute. I just wanted to show you real quick their commute. This is how they had to walk. Look at me. If you notice, I'm wearing sporting some sporty Carthart brown overalls. Um, and you can see my belly sticking out a little bit there, too. So this is how far they walk. They go past cattle, fields. They, you got, they walk over other streams. There's no, the bridge right here, you can see uh, they just made it so they could cross that ditch. Then they literally have to go into the water. So these people are literally having, now if you notice here, this is what they have to cross to go to school or to go to the hospital. 
so they missed. I remember when we first opened, one of the girls said, thank you for letting me go to school every day this year because I would miss months of school because they couldn't get across the river. So it was really cool. And you can see other ways. Now, you notice everybody's walking. So they would go to school, take their shoes off, and then walk across the thing. Now, that's all fine and good when it's not the rainy season. But when it is a rainy season, it's a little bit harder to walk through there. So these are just, so, and by the way, that bus, <laughs> they washed their bus in the river. How about that, Denrec? <laughs> so this is how far she, she walked. They, they have an older daughter, but she walked to get to school. Um, basically, now this doesn't really tell you anything, but it's got a pretty yellow arrow and stuff, but it's a long walk to go there. Those people walked everywhere, and I, I got to say I'm very lazy. That's what it taught me because... They have a lot of stuff. So this is what we wanted them to see. Now, I have no idea. Can you guys see Scott? What is he doing? Um, but he's there, and there I am again with the one shoulder strap overall. Look. Which, by the way, they made fun of me the whole time. I was down there. Everybody made fun of me. But that's what we wanted. So if you notice, it's a suspension bridge that we were able to, to make so that they can get to school or to the hospital when there's some sort of storm or, or however they need it. So, Bridges to Prosperity, who's heard of them? Raise your hand. They basically have offices in different areas. Is Third World not PC? But in areas where the, the income isn't much and they're not very, the technology isn't there. So basically, they have them in Bolivia, which they stopped right now. They're not, in, they're not working in Bolivia right now because of what happened there. And they're also in Rwanda and somewhere else in Africa, I think. But at any rate, they, um, this year, where's John Tice? Tice, did he leave? Stand up, John. That good-looking bald guy is going to go to Rwanda, Africa. So uh, we appreciate the golf, golfing outing that we had that, that raised some money. We're going to talk about that, but he was able to go. So long story short, Scott gets to tell you about the real cool stuff. But it's a great organization that allows people to be connected to their community and their services. And we appreciate every year everybody helping us out and being supportive. Some of you guys gave just straight up cash to us. Um, and we're very supportive of our food and everything. And it was, we couldn't have done it without you guys because it's not a cheap trip. So we really, really do appreciate it. Um, but with no further ado, Scott Walls. Thank you. I think we survived any lawsuits there, <laughs> Craig. Uh, just piggyback a little bit about Bridges to Prosperity. This is uh, a stat that they uh, provided us when we first got started on this trip. That's one out of every seven people in the developing world lacks safe transportation uh, to essential services that we all take for granted. And of course, it's an industry that we all work for, so we, we probably just can't quite realize um, you know, that these, these people just don't have the same things that we do. It's amazing. Uh, just to start to talk about Bridges to Prosperity a little bit more and, and sort of how the organization worked for our trip, it was kind of broken down into three legs. We had the B2P staff. Uh, the picture there on the left is Maria. She was our construction lead. They work full time for B2P staff around the world. They're responsible for the bridge design. They coordinate bringing the materials to the site, and they, they actually built the substructure. We'll look at that a little bit more. Second leg is the local leadership. Um, those are people that actually live uh, in these communities. They identify the site, identify the need for the bridge, and they work to uh, bring local volunteers to help us do construction and then maintain the bridge in the future. And the third part is where we kind of fit in here is, is bringing funding, traveling, volunteers, and actually performing the superstructure construction of the bridge. So we carry on. Who participated? We have 11 people that uh, traveled from across the US, Delaware to California, a great mix of DOT people, uh, private entities, um, and some steel fabricators. Um, many of the building materials were donated, and we'll look at who donated those materials, but the materials were donated. So there's a, a lot of groups of people that are, are contributing to just one big bridge build. And the travel expenses, what's important, is all incurred by the volunteers. And so that's where a lot of the funding comes in. And, uh, and then, of course, Del Dot, uh, we used uh, two weeks of annual time to, to be able to travel to Bolivia and, and work on this structure. So if you're like me, you probably wondered, well, really, where is Bolivia? Uh, it's, it's where I started. Bolivia is uh, right in central South America, kind of landlocked. And if you follow the picture to the right, you can look at Sucre, which is one of three major cities, uh, the other two being La Paz and Cochabamba. Maybe you've heard of those. 
Um, from Sucre, we, well, we, Craig and I flew out of Philly. We were supposed to meet the entire 11 team members in uh, Miami and fly from Miami to Sucre. Uh, Philadelphia's flight was delayed, and there's only one flight out of Miami. So Craig and I missed today, which we spent in a very luxurious Miami hotel. Um, but anyway, Sucre, beautiful city, about 9,200 uh, feet in elevation. So sea, or, um, altitude sickness was, of course, uh, a bit of a concern, especially for Craig and I coming from sea level. And it uh, is in a mountainous region. Su to, from Sucre to Azudui was about a nine-hour drive. So we rented three vehicles, um, mid-sized Toyota Hiluxes, and beautiful scenery, of course. You can see some of the photos there. Um, Traffic safety, not so much. No warning signs. Here's a huge curve with a, just a straight drop off, off the, uh, the mountain cliff there. No guardrail. Who knows what's coming around that corner, whether it's a heavy truck coming down grade or not. What the bailout location is, I don't really know. Tried to close my eyes as much as possible. Um, love the picture in the top there of that bull. Uh, just staring you down as you're driving. You don't want to make him mad, so maybe that's their traffic control policy. <laughs> Once we got there, we actually had some pretty great accommodations. We had this very beautiful Spanish-style home with a center courtyard. Um, by Bridges to Prosperity standards, most of the time they anticipate staying in tents. Um, so we were very fortunate to have a, a roof structure above us. Uh, that was the room that I stayed in on the bottom right there. Uh, we stayed in cots, and uh, the Delaware sweatshirt across that cot is, was my particular bed. Uh, the food, the food was super important. All food was purchased in Sucre and then uh, delivered with us as we drove out to uh, Azardui. Um, on the left, you can see all the important things like potatoes and yucca plantains, all those things that nourish the body. Um, but then in the center are all the comforts of home that we couldn't resist purchasing, the Oreos and the Pringles. And of course, all of that was all gone probably three or four days into the trip. Um, the receipt on the right is, is the size of a small human. So we, we ate very well. Um, so the bridge, the bridge is a, a steel suspension bridge. It was designed by the members of Bridges to Prosperity, so not by us. Uh, we were given the plans prior to leaving. Uh, we met all of our team members via video conferencing and kind of discussed how this bridge, you know, construction site was going to go to. Somehow Craig and I were tasked with, uh, with developing the schedule, and we'll take a look at what that entailed in a little bit. So here's the bridge, again, a uh, suspension bridge, 110 meters was the main span, which is about 361 feet across. Total length of the bridge, about 580 feet. We kind of break this down into five uh, stages of construction. The first one being the tower and the anchors. That's the substructure or the foundation. The second part being the towers. These are the vertical members right over the uh, center there. Second part was the main cables. Fourth part, sorry, fourth part was the vertical suspenders. And then the fifth part was the decking that you're actually going to walk on. So back to that plan that Craig and I put together. This is Craig's schedule. He did a fantastic job, tried to create the CPM schedule, completed it with colors, the Bolivia flag, whole nine yards. We started April 15th. We had to be completed by, Jan by April 26th. That was 11 days because our visas expired and we were forced to leave. So it had to be done. Um, like all things, this schedule went out the window before we even left, because we missed the first flight. So <laughs> there goes all of that work. Um, now this is the foundation going in. I was able to get some of these photos from the members of B2P. This was completed prior to, to when we arrived. Um, the photo on the left is an anchor for the main cables. It was dug deep into the ground with soil placed on top to resist the force of the cables trying to pull it out of the ground. And then on the right is uh, the foundation for the towers. And of course, all of this was dug out by hand. There's no heavy equipment in sight. Um, after excavation, similar to how we do it here, just place the rebar and uh, concrete. Of course, concrete trucks aren't available, so all the concrete was mixed in these small mixers that you see mounted on the left. Um, and the, on the right, it's kind of interesting, they had to raise the towers because of the flood zone, and so they built this nice little ramp to, to meet the top of the tower. Um, concrete was all placed and cured prior to when we got there. Uh, for those of you that might work with concrete, their assumed concrete design strength was only 1,450 PSI, which is pretty low. I mean, obviously, their resources are much different. Compare that to what we work with, maybe 4,500 PSI. Some of our ultra-high strengths can get up to 22 KSI, so not a lot of design strength that they're counting on concrete. Um, just like here, they're no different than a couple of challenges. So as soon as they started digging on their first anchor, they ran into some groundwater issues, and they couldn't excavate as deep as they originally planned to. So they ended up with a shallower anchor, and the way to get around that was, of course, to, to 
add counterweights to this anchor by adding gabion walls. Um, where do you get rocks on short notice? From the river. So all of these rocks were picked out of the river by these local volunteers, carried to this rock gabion basket wall, and then stacked beautifully. A lot of uh, hard work went into it, which was really cool to see, because the local community really wanted this to not only work, but they wanted it to be beautiful and to, to stay there for a very long time. So uh, we were happy to see all the craftsmanship that went into it on their end. Looking towards the towers a little bit more, um, the tow towers are fabricated, painted, and then shipped to the site from Cochabamba. Um, they were dropped off by a truck, and then where they were picked up by hand, each one of those tower pieces, those vertical pieces, uh, were about 1,000 pounds. And this is what Craig and I missed by missing our first day. So we might have lucked out um, each one about 33 feet tall. So then the cross members were bolted together. We got a rare video or shot of Craig bolting things. Just kidding. Um, so next was the, the tower lift. So the tower has been assembled um, in the horizontal position. And a lot of careful uh, consideration was taken at this time. There's a tremendous amount of force that was going to be placed on that scaffolding that you see in the picture. Um, the way this tower was going to be erected was by a come along placed in the center, towards the center span, and a cable went up and over the um, scaffolding through a pulley and then connected to the, the top end of the tower, and it was going to be pulled up in place. Um, and this was probably a great time to remember that Sucre, the nearest hospital, was nine hours away. So safety was a, a serious consideration from Visions of Prosperity. They did a phenomenal job trouble-checking plans, triple-checking plans, keeping everyone safe, wearing harnesses, the whole nine yards. And, and luckily, everything went as planned. Here's just a, a good look at that tower uh, coming up into place, um, help with the come-along being just erected vertically, um, but not all the way vertical. So this was something that I learned. Uh, the, the tower couldn't be necessarily placed vertically because uh, when you put the, the main cables on, it was going to want to pull the tower forward a little bit more. So they set the, the towers with a little bit of what they called can or a little bit of a backward angle, which was calculated in design. And then we had to use some fancy mathematics in the field to make sure we got that can't set correctly. So when the main cables were in place, it would actually pull those, uh, those towers up to a plump condition. Cables. Man, let me tell you about cables. They all had to be moved by hand as a group of team. There was no heavy equipment again. Each cable had to be uncoiled. You can see it just piled up here, dropped off the back of a truck. They had to be anchored on one end of the bridge, then carried, drug 581 feet to the other side of the bridge, up over both towers, across the river, and then anchored into the other side. There's no way to get it across the river besides walking across that river. So if you only had one pair of boots, you're going to have wet feet for a few days at least. Uh, the gentleman here, maybe he had it figured out. He's got his hard hat, his safety uh, gloves, but his safety shoes, a <laughs> little lacking. Another lesson that we learned was we thought every day we were done pulling cables, but it turned out that there were more cables to pull. We pulled four main cables. They were an inch and a quarter in diameter, which is about four pounds per foot. So that one cable laying there is about 3,000 pounds or more. Um, of course, the only way to move it was big groups of team members just standing you know, shoulder to shoulder and dragging the cable along. The picture on the bottom there is uh, the Norfolk, Virginia port. Those cables were actually donated um, after they were used in those cranes. Um, so after their service life, they were sent to Bolivia to be repurposed in this bridge. Um, there was more cables. We had wind guy cables, we had restraint cables, and we had safety cables. So it felt like every day there were cables to pull. A few lessons there. Man, I'll tell you what, that will wear you out. It was an honest day of work. Everything is covered in grease. The gloves, this is Craig. He found an efficient way to remove uh, ga or grease with a gasoline-soaked rag. Maybe that explains some things. Um, <laughs> and then, man, it's exhausted. Both of us are absolutely exhausted. If you're curious, the cables are clamped with a C-clamp um, at each anchorage. And basically, the C-clamp just puts a, a force um, on the cable to, to prevent them from slipping away from each other. Moving on to the uh, initial cable sack. So this is all we could do with human power to get these cables up out of the water. Um, you can tell that that's probably not going to work for the long term. It's uh, variable, to say the least, and nothing's probably going to hang from that. So we uh, worked with this temporary cable to, uh, to basically connect to the main cable, pull it back, and then reset. Connect again, pull it back with the come along, and kind of continue. That's Craig and I probably both weigh 150 pounds soaking wet, trying to pull down on the cable so those guys can apply, <laughs> apply the C-clamp. <laughs> um, but we were doing all we could to help out on that one. 
And, uh, and then we love to point out this easy job. This gentleman got to spend the day on the top of that scaffolding with some surveying equipment. Uh, he was quick to tell us where we needed to be all day, but he stood up there. And uh, he could look across with his surveying equipment and see how far up we needed to bring the cables uh, to, to be at you know, the specific point specified in the plans. And so we finally, we reached that cable sag, and this is a picture the, the next morning after the cable sag had been set with the fog in the valley. It was a really beautiful shot. Kind of felt like we were finally getting somewhere with this bridge. Concurrently, while those cables were going on, not everybody was needed to uh, hang cables. So at the same time, we were fabricating suspenders. Remember, those are the vertical legs. Uh, they were done with just half-inch rebar. Each one had to be cut and bent the top and the bottom had this specific bend, so we created this jig on the top there um, to bend the rebar. Um, you know, most of our rebar here in the States is bent prior to coming to the site, so we were doing our best to bend it on site with the limited tools that we had. There's 110 pairs of suspenders. Each one was a different length because the bridge wasn't symmetrical, so it took a lot to organize and make sure these suspenders were in the, in the right location. Suspenders were attached to floor beams, which were assembled next. 110 uh, floor beams, two suspenders per floor beam, about five foot wide. The reason for the narrow width was to, uh, to try to avoid uh, heavier vehicles from traveling over the bridge or you know, large droves of, of cattle. And organization, again, was key because uh, you have the bridge profile, which is kind of a crest shape, and the sag of the cables. So each, each one of those suspenders had to be the right length to uh, make it all flow together. And uh, we mentioned the flag color here. We painted the floor beams the color of the national flag. And we laid out the floor beams. And then we heard the next day that they wanted the flag to be in the opposite direction. So where they were looking down on the valley, it would be facing the right direction. And that was OK. But then we had to pick up each one of those floor beams and carry it back over to the other side of the river. Um, again, it's you know, a little bit of work. And we're, we're happy that the, the local community at least cared um, to see the bridge constructed in that way. So then it was up to hanging floor beams. So uh, they were connected. We drove, uh, climbed up to the top of the scaffolding. We were able to take the top hook and uh, hang it over those main cables. We started with the, the center span floor beam. And we could hang multiple at a time, connect it to the restraint cable, and then pull the restraint cable out, which then launched these floor beams out into the center. Here's a better view of that. Um, you can see it, the cables in the center of that uh, left picture which you would you know, stand in the river and be able to pull out, and then the floor beams would incrementally come out. Craig and I uh, got a, a great chance, an opportunity to be at the top of the scaffolding. The views from up there were the best anywhere, and you could see progress, so we, we had our Dot hats on to represent home, and uh, it was a beautiful place to be. So next, we're starting to get towards what we might think of as a real bridge. We're preparing decking boards. These are the timber boards that the pedestrians are going to walk on. 168 boards in total. Each one of them had to be brought on, cut, pre-drilled. A lot of work, a lot of repetitive work here. Um, and then we could place the deck boards. And so we could stagger the deck boards to create a, a stiffer deck. Um, and it was, we realized quickly this was most efficient to work in team. And so we sort of assembled a, a line of people to carry deck boards and pass them to the people on the front end of this bridge and just continue to work our way out towards the mid-span until it was complete. Um, it's a good shot here. We tried at first to, to sort of feather these light-colored boards in, like maybe your hardwood floor, you know. You create this beautiful um, mosaic, and we ran out of light boards. So there was the end of that. Wind guys were next. They, uh, they were just simply lateral supports. More cables needed to be pulled across the river and anchored. Chain link fence for a little bit of safety. These normal chain link fence were rolled out in advance, painted, uh, measured, and cut, and then carried onto the bridge in one long section. And that was a completed bridge. 11 days. We finished it just the, the night before the inauguration was planned. A good long shot view of that bridge. And then Inauguration Day was, was an awesome time. The, the community planned this event. You can see all the workers are, were hiding out in that shade underneath the bridge. We are all exhausted and ready to head home. Um, but they threw a huge party. They cooked us food. They provided us with gifts of homemade cheeses and apples. And it was, it was a tremendous event. A lot of music and dancing. Um, the secret drink that is in this bucket, we don't really know what it was. But they served it out of the bucket and into spoons. And, by then, we were fine with it, so we were headed home soon. Uh, of course, before it's open to traffic, got to load test the bridge, so a couple of the volunteers rode a horse over the bridge. All was well, open to traffic. 
Uh, you could tell the community really loved the bridge. They were, you know, happy to, kids were running back and forth. They were just totally excited that it was there and um, it was gonna be there for, for their future. Uh, probably most importantly, Alejandro came to the site and gave us the thumbs up approval. And so just to re sort of circle back to where we were and who made this possible, of course it was a, a National Steel Bridge Alliance partnership with B2P, but many of you in this room really made this possible. And I uh, just wanted to thank all of you from our golf fundraiser. Um, we, we raised a, an incredible amount of money to not only send Craig and I, uh, but to also, sort of spoiler alert, to send John Tice, who's up next. He'll be leaving on March 20th, uh, headed to Rwanda, Africa to build a 35 meter suspension bridge. So we, we wish John all the best. And that's the end. If you're interested more into Bridges Prosperity, they have some great social media outlets that post a lot of uh, inspiring things if you're interested. And uh, again, appreciate everyone in this room for making this possible. Thank you. Thanks, Scott, for keeping them in line as best as you could. Um, our next presenter is our part two. Um, Oz is going to uh, finish up with his 2020 specification update in standard construction detail. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I've had the, at least I didn't have to hold you up from lunch, but I do have to uh, follow after a great presentation that that was um, to talk about details. So uh, try to stay with me. I uh, only have 15 minutes, so we'll try to make this quick in that fashion. Uh, when we went into the 2020 spe standard specifications, uh, we started going over as we started comparing apples to apples on the details, we started realizing there's some things that we need to uh, address in uh, details as well. So, uh, so far, the standard details is about 183 sheets as it sits. Um, uh, we're not addressing about 40, so we had to go through, and some of them are minor, some of them are majors. Uh, some of them are as simple as just correcting the, like the detectable warning domes or truncated domes. They're supposed to be detectable uh, warning surfaces. Uh, so just a uh, kind of minor tweaks there, but just something that we changed in the specs, but we didn't uh, manipulate the details to match that aspect. Uh, so we're trying to correct some of that. Um, another one, uh, is it personal or personnel? Um, it was in the details was written twice. Uh, in, the, in the details it actually says personnel. In the specification it said personal. And then in the language of the the spec, it said personnel. So um, I'm a terrible one to ask about spelling, but um, we did get that clarified in that perspective. Uh, also 2020, do we need the metric? Right in the cover sheet, it actually says metric details, um, metrics and standards. So we're, we had a period of time that we were going into metric. Um, we have since removed most of that within it, and there's still a dozen or better pages that have metrics in there. So some of the updates will just be a matter of uh, editing those sides and making them uh, more English based. Uh, as MASH, uh, Mark Buckley already spoke about MASH, where we are. This whole section is going to follow the manual for accessing safety hardware um, under construction. Uh, we, we've got some more information that come into light, but uh, all those sheets are gonna change uh, for, in those sides. Curb and gutter, uh, some of those aspects in, in that part, uh, everything's PCC. Uh, there's a couple different ways that we actually put it in there, P.C.C. Uh, or is it Portland cement concrete. So we try to make everything uniform. PCC is our, you know, across the board. That's in the specs, that's in the details. Everyone understands what that abbreviation means. Um, we're also gonna add in the roundabout. Uh, it's something that we've used quite a bit and there's quite a bit of roundabouts that are being designed. So we wanna make sure it becomes a standard for availability. Um, the difference between the roundabout curb, obviously it's more, it's more plowable and traversable and, and, and it's made for roundabouts for, for the mounting of tra trailering traffic. Um, got into the drainage side of things. 
um, trying to alleviate like the 34, 18 inch. Um, it can be used within the roadway, but it's not intended to be used for greater than four foot in depth. Clarification on that is more of a, it's really more maintenance um, and also just availability of installing steps. Um, in order to install the steps in the field, you use a hammer drill. <clears throat> the hammer drill can't fit within the uh, area of the 18 inch when you have a 16 inch step. So I got that clarified from lab, um, appreciate it on that behalf. So it's, it's really just about feasibility. Um, you know, if you go beyond four feet, you've got to have steps. So um, you, we, we need to go with the 34, 24 and above at that point. Continue with drainage. Um, there are some details that we got into our isometrics with the 18 inches outside of the box. There was some clarification that we've commonly see an error on is that the intent is the 18 inches is, goes outside of the actual concrete box not the inlet or frame. Uh, so isometrically, I mean, you shouldn't see a symmetrical lid at times. Uh, there's very often these lids are offset for access. Again, they have steps to go down into the boxes. So it's not gonna be uncommon to see a box with uh, maybe only 24, 30, 36 inches on one side and then a, a, you know, you may have a full curb section on the other side of eight, 10 feet, depending on how large the box goes. Um, also, the type A cover uh, can be used for more than just a grass area. Uh, we use that for the rehabs uh, very commonly to update and do. And we've had some look at the rebar. We're good on that behalf. Uh, but we are going to call out what type of rebar that is. Um, very commonly in the heads, uh, we see number four rebar uh, when the intention is to use number five. The way it's been called out is S. Uh, like an S501, 502, 503, and we try to clarify that by actually placing in there that's number five rebar. There's more changes ahead. Uh, we still haven't look, finished up to finalize the dog box inlets, the manhole details, uh, and we're also looking at adding a flared end support, as you see in the top right of the screen, uh, just to help with the erosion and other aspects of that of the flared ends. Uh, if that comes into play, it uh, will most likely be uh, as in, in piece of the flared end, part of the flared end. So uh, I know we took out incidental, but it won't be written as incidental. It will be written as a, a continuation of that part. Um, and round manholes right now, we uh, this one, as you see in there, was adjusted to flush with pavement. Again, in the pavement rehab aspect of it. But uh, how much rebar, what type of rebar do we put in? That's something that we've... Uh, challenged quite a bit in the field, yet we haven't had anything in play. So we're trying to correct that aspect of it. Erosion, uh, the erosion section, uh, try to get into what is the standards, meet the standards that are required by DENRAC. Uh, actually, as were they very implied in the field. Uh, so if the uh, silk fence is, you know, if we call out 24 inches high on silk fence, but they only manufacture it at 18, uh, should, we be, should we use 24? Um, so we're trying to create some uniformity, uh, such as the silt fence. Another one is the drainage, the inlet sediment control for a drainage box. Uh, they're changing this. This is something that Maryland has used, uh, and it works very well with fence posts and, and fencing versus the two by fours and the, and the fabrics that we've used in the past. So we're trying to make something more feasible, easier to maintain. Uh, and it's going to have to grow as we learn. Seem, and when we're trying to build off of learning off of one another with DOTs. Compost filter logs, we use those quite often uh, rather than the stone. We still want to have that availability of stone, but in essence, if it's called out to, be, to use a compost fil filter log, we want to be able to provide the detail. So we kind of give an option A, option B, and it depends on the designer as it's designed what is needed, what their, what their intent is, and as it moves forward. Uh, the number three stone that you see here is not going to stay in place. That's something that uh, Denmark uses, but sediment takes care of a lot of that aspect of it. It's also a large event may wash that stone down the, down the stream that we don't want. Um, again, uh, check dams. Right now we only have stone. Uh, we use a lot of composite filter logs, so we're trying to clarify that aspect of it too. And then the last erosion is the temporary 
installation of the, uh, such as the temporary slope drains. Instead of excavating out, uh, we really want to limit the disturbance in the field. It also allows us to uh, less, disturb less disturbance for excavation, less disturbance for building it back into its existing, pre-existing condition. So the stone could be placed on the surface and built up versus uh, trying to dig out and, and have it flow on that side of things. So just trying to different, different methods um, and grow from that point. In the next section, miscellaneous, uh, this was a comment that was made as a fashion that sometimes we need to have the uniformity amongst sides of slopes, uh, just a, a minor. Uh, there was a couple other miscellaneous uh, details that we're getting into as well. Again, I'm just trying to keep this short. Pavement, uh, the PC slabs was 20. Uh, we're going into 15. Uh, that seems to be the, the, the latest that we're going with. And hot pour joint sealant. Uh, it, the way our detail was before, it was a double cut, a little deeper. Uh, it also uh, required backer rods. Backer rods have problems. So speaking with the lab, this seems to be a, a better solution for PCC payment. And we try to make sure that our curb detail in the specification matches the 15 foot. So when we get into the specifications uh, when, uh, for curb, instead of 60 feet, 160 feet of length, it's 150 foot of length. Uh, if not, the 15 foot wouldn't work. So we want to make sure that if you have a curb next to a pavement, that the curb joints follow the pavement joints. Um, the pavement safety edge, one of the aspects that we had is the range of 26 to 40. It was 32 plus or minus uh, a couple degrees. And now we actually have a range, which kind of gives a direct indication of the contractor what we're to use. And the, we didn't want to put this in the specifications and the details. So we want one place to put this in, one place to correct it if we need to change it or correct it. Uh, so if we would decide if we want to increase the range, decrease the range, we only need to change it in the details. The details uh, would allow that versus putting it in the specifications and then putting it in the details. And which one do you follow? We're also trying to look at this in the fashion that there's times that we're putting this on new pavement versus old pavement, at what point? Uh, we, it says right now to use existing pavement, but what if you have only have a five foot, so, five foot shoulder and it's a bike lane? Should you utilize that bike lane at that point in time or use the existing? Well, if it's an 11 foot lane, now if you put this on it, you're gonna lose lane. Um, and grow, as we grow, or as we continue and we continue placing this, if we, we could lose inches of roadway, which could turn into feet later on down the way. So just trying to think long term to what we have to resolve. On the traffic section, uh, in every meeting, we went through each one individually just as quickly as this. Um, <laughs> it ended up being something that it wasn't an afterthought. It was just the end of the meeting real quick. We got to go over this. So uh, these are the couple changes that we're making. Hopefully everyone got this. Not a problem. Have yourself a good day. Um, no, in all seriousness, uh, traffic section, there's a big change in this part. Uh, quite a few sheets that are being changed. Some of them are minor, some of them are majors. Uh, no, uh, one that was added in that uh, I felt was completely different was the traffic, the temporary pedestrian pathway. Something we use quite a bit in construction, and they wanted some indication of how to use this. Now, this isn't indicated as... Uh, this railing is here just as guidance. It's not really a handrail. It's not considered uh, pedestrian to keep them on the path. Uh, we tried to follow some of the criteria for uh, the walking sticks to, to allow for detectability. Um, but in the same essence, you don't want the, the block drainage so that it ponds water on top of it either. So it's got to be a, a non non-skid surface, uh, but it's temporary. It is made for different applications. It will have to be looked at in uh, every application. There's also the, to the left side is the application of either it can be concrete, hot mix, cold patch, or compacted millings. Uh, so GABC, crushed concrete, they're not acceptable surfaces in the uh, aspects of ADA. Um, so it's, it's, we have to follow those criteria, and we're trying to make the specs follow that criteria. The pedestrian 
push buttons. I don't know if it's got it. Oh, there's new pedestrian. There you go. Apologize. The pedestrian push button locations. Uh, this is something also that was added new. Uh, the rest of the specs were the, in the traffic section were definitely something that were adjusting and moving, but these are kind of the new perspective of what they are. So this kind of gives you a push button location, kind of gives you signage, and get, makes you go for that sense. Last uh, in the traffic section was the, uh, the electrical service pedestals. Uh, before there was, uh, I believe, two, maybe three. Uh, we're up to about five sheets now, so it gives them a little more information, a little more for the text to have for installation. So uh, right now, still under construction. We're still reviewing the specs. We're still reviewing the details. We're not, anything is not finalized. As you can see, there's a lot of red sketches and, and edits that we have on there. So we are definitely moving. But we just wanted to kind of give a, an update for where we are. We are updating quite a few sheets. In that fashion, uh, getting rid of the metrics, uh, new, the new barrier section, new traffic section. A lot of the erosion section was updated to meet DENREX and other criteria that we have. And the uh, importance of trying to meet the specifications and the details to make everything match. So that being said, any questions? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Oz. All right, our next presenter is Billy Sweeney. He's going to talk about e-construction and Unifier. And yes, we did drink the Kool-Aid with Unifier, and we're all in. And uh, hopefully, he'll also be telling you some of the neat things that we have in store with adding to the Unifier family. <laughs> Yes, my plan is working. I, uh, I've been carrying the uh, Unifier uh, flag, I guess, for, I think we're going on five years now. Um, and it, it's, it's something that I really like talking about. I think that what we're doing as a department is being recognized nationally. Uh, I, I get invited to webinars to speak. I get invited to go to other states to speak. Um, I have people calling from other states interested in what we're doing. And, and when you have a uh, a program like what we're doing and, and what we're trying to implement, I think that speaks volumes when you have, um, you know, the, the state of Washington calling and wanting to know how we are doing things with this Unifier application with our e-construction implementation. And um, it, it's kind of neat to be involved in. It's, as somebody who's been with the department for, uh, I guess it's uh, going on 22 years, uh, I, I've been involved in a lot, but this has been some of the most exciting stuff I've been doing. And it's probably the thing I have the least amount of experience in. So. Um, you know, when I get up in front of these, sometimes I, I kind of have to be pulled off, but to be honest with you, today is going to be a pretty quick, quick, pretty, uh, quick presentation trying to get through. Just going to give you an overview on uh, what we've done, give you some numbers uh, on some of the processes that we've, we've, we've put in place, um, and then um, give you an overview of where I think we're going to go and, and what our plan is from uh, e-construction and unifier implementation. So right now in Unifier, we've uh, implemented 12 main business processes. These are things like our contracts, um, uh, inspector daily reports, price approvals, quantity adjustments, change orders, the list you see there pretty much. Um, what we tried to do with these is we, we wanted to pick things that were typically paper intense, uh, things that we could get out of th that realm of creating that, that piece of paper that gets stored in a file somewhere that eventually has to get archived and find a way to, to, to to uh, insert it uh, electronically. So we started off with inspector daily reports um, as a thing that's the most intense in, in a lot of cases um, as far as creating paper goes. Uh, and in doing that, we had to create some other things that would help us with, with getting our inspector daily reports in place. So that's where, in, in Unifier terms, the contract comes in. We have to build the contract in Unifier that has the items in it, that has uh, information like the first chargeable day, last chargeable day, NTP date, all that kind of stuff has to be in Unifier in order for the IDR to work the way we want. Price approvals, uh, change orders, pencil estimates, progress estimates, all, all this stuff you see there all at some point is used in, you know, as part of the IDR or as part of our, uh, of our construction documentation process to where we're at. Uh, in addition to what you see there are those nine or those 12 main BPs or nine kind of support business processes. Um, so these are things like our uh, pay item, a project pay item list, a 
master uh, company level PM list, vendor list, so we know all the, prime, the who the prime contractor is, all of the subcontractor um, that are subcontractors that are on the uh, on the projects, and, and kind of a myriad of other things that we had to build again to try and support the 12 main business processes that we've put in place uh, up to this point. Um, of the 12 you see up there, uh, they're all pretty much workflow based, meaning it's not just I create a record and it's done, it has to go through some sort of a review process. Um, and then luckily for us, um, we did have a pretty good uh, documentation of what these forms or these processes were, so we were able to use those forms and processes to develop the actual unifier business processes. So we didn't have to recreate the wheel. It was really taking what we already were doing and finding a way to make it uh, you know, electronic. And in some cases, that's pretty easy to do. In some cases, that was um, you know, a little difficult. Uh, you know, being a small state, you would think that we all did things exactly the same. Um, you know, but a lot of times we didn't. You know, we have the three uh, three main groups in, in dots construction, and then the four districts in, in maintenance that we're all trying to get to do the same thing. And when you have seven different groups of people doing things, sometimes twelve different ways, um, you know, it was kind of hard to get everybody to come to come to the table and agree that this is the way as a department we wanted to go. So the idea being that we were as consistent as possible across across the board. And then even then, when we got right there at about the 90% mark, we're like, all right, we got everybody doing things the same way. I get that one phone call. It's like, hey, on this project, it's kind of special. Okay, and then you get another call. This project's kind of special. It's like, all right, so the next thing you know, it's like our projects are all snowflakes. It's like everything's different, everything's special. And trying to kind of rope everybody back into that, look, we're technically doing the same thing. And while it may not work exactly the way you're used to, this is the way the department's deciding to go and, and, and trying to uh, push people in that direction. So we started using the uh, Inspector Daily Report business process in March of 2017. Um, and I have some numbers for you in a minute, but we got a lot of experience in Unifier as a department from our field inspection staff, just getting them involved in using this, the application because as most people know, in the construction field, the IDR is what helps us with building our, our daily diary, our daily, uh, the information that happens on a project. Well, we're using that information on the IDR to create our estimates or to, to have to create a, a change order. So it was important for us to get lots of experience out there. We didn't want to jump right in and say, okay, create an IDR on day one, and 30 days later, we're going to do a, a progress estimate based on that exact IDR. Um, so we wanted to give everybody plenty of, of time. Uh, I, th I think it went a little bit longer we wanted. We'd have liked to have had estimates in before uh, May of 2019, but just the way it worked, it is what it is. Um, so we've been doing estimates change orders, like, like it shows there, since May of 2019. Uh, to give you some numbers, up until this point, we've had around 190 projects that's run through Unifier in some way, shape, or form. Um, that comes out to just a little over 50,000 inspector daily reports. That's technically 50,000 pieces of paper on those projects that are, are electronic. Um, 675 price approvals that were completed and would have been done all electronic, 175 change orders, and 170 estimates. Now, those last two numbers were only on 40 projects since May of 2019. That's not all 190. Um, so you can see, and j just at looking at those numbers, it doesn't seem like a lot when you think about the, the pieces of paper that are in folders or in files that are in, uh, you know, in the trailers. You know, that, that's saving us, uh, saving us a lot of time, saving us a lot of money. Um, and, and definitely saving us a lot of space. So I'm going to run through a couple of the, the, the main business processes just to give you an idea. It's kind of small, I know, but um, when you get to see this presentation later, if you ever get a chance to look at it, we have a log of every inspector daily report. This is um, Limestone Road up, up in Group 1. Um, so just a list of every IDR tells you uh, what, the, um, what status it's in, who created it, what's the date on it. This is a picture of the actual form. Those of you up front can probably see this a lot better than those in the back. Um, but it, it gives a, an in, the inspector this, a, a place to pick what time were they on site, what time they leave. Their daily remarks on it, their weather, it's all in here. The weather notes, any, um, anything additional that they would typically write on a piece of paper or on a PDF or an Excel form is done right here in Unifier from a tablet or from a, from a laptop. We track personnel and equipment. Uh, the actual pay item has a, a, a picker on it. You don't have to type in numbers. You pick what's on the contract, uh, if it's an existing item, or you pick from a, a master list uh, if it's a new item on the project. And then um, this last one just shows you uh, the different uh, types of new items that you have to, what we call non-bid pay items in, in Unifier's parlance. 
Uh, we're also tracking material. So this is the time, this is uh, pipe deliveries or uh, borrowed deliveries, that kind of stuff that comes into the site and visitors uh, that come on site. So again, all things that you would typically put on an IDR in paper format is done in Unifier. It captures everything electronically. And then at the end of the day, what Unifier creates is a PDF version of that IDR that looks almost exactly like what, would, what you would have typically used or an inspector would have typically used uh, on a piece of paper. So this helps with the person who has to look at these IDRs and has to review them or has to audit them. Audit them. They're not looking at something different. They're actually seeing what they've seen for the last 25 years. And as I said before, workflow-based, everything uh, that we can create has, has a workflow to it in most cases. And this is just a sample where it gets created, goes through a review and a revision process, and then uh, goes to the end. Quantity adjustments. So this is kind of new for the department. Quantity adjustments in, in Unifier is, is like a dumbed-down IDR. It's the item version of an IDR. So if you have a, uh, a mistake on an inspector daily report that's found after a blue check, you don't have to go through and do a whole new IDR again. You can just simply do a quantity adjustment on here. It gives you all the places to, uh, to add remarks, to make comments, that kind of stuff, so we know why you're doing that quantity adjustment. It's also used uh, in, in, in times where you have uh, maybe an item that's paid uh, each month, so you don't have to do that on IDR. You can do it right here as a quantity adjustment. Again, workflow-based. Pretty simple. Price approvals, uh, this is one of those ones that would replace the need to have to create a Word file, then that Word file is manually typed in by somebody with the information and, and tables are, uh, are, you know, tables created with all your items that you're approving onto the project. Um, so this gives you the ability to actually build your body, the, the body of the letter that gets sent to the contractor with an upper or top and a bottom paragraph. You pick the items that you're adding to the project uh, based on that price approval using a form similar to what had been used in the IDR. Uh, and then it creates a letter that looks like this. And this letter would actually, um, in, in the way this letter looks now, the bottom where it says sincerely at the bottom is actually an electronic signature that pops up there to say it's done. So when that uh, workflow is completed, that letter is actually emailed directly to the contractor. No need to mail it, no need to, to print it and scan it and then send it. It's automatically emailed to the contractor um, you know, once you're done. Again, uh, it's a pretty simple workflow for this one too, just to submit a revision cycle and then it goes to the end. Change orders, these are the, the, a couple of the newer BPs that we've got in place now. Um, so again, everybody knows what a change order is, but it gives you some high level information that you have to fill out. Information about the contract there at the bottom. Um, when you go in to add the items, you just pick your item that you're adding to the project or if you're modifying a quantity. Type the information in, pick your reason code, which is a predefined list um, that, that's, that's stored in Unifier. Uh, put your quantity in that you're changing, automatically calculates up what your amount is. Goes through the same thing, a workflow with a revision process. And then at the end of the day, it adds the item or modifies that quantity, however you need to take care of it. Progress estimates, same thing. Everybody knows what an estimate is. Um, upper level form is pretty simple. Put the information in that you need is from, a, from an estimate standpoint. Gives you a place to put some remarks if there's something special about that estimate, um, such as advanced material payments or something like that that you just need the rest of the uh, project team to know about. The uh, neat thing with what we've done with the estimate process is as your inspection staff is creating your IDRs, um, instead of having to manually retype those quantities based on an Excel spreadsheet that somebody's keeping or, or having to manually add them up, when the uh, construction field staff submits the, work, the, the record through the workflow, it'll automatically reach out and grab all the quantities out of the IDRs for that time period. Insert them into this BP and then we'll actually calculate everything up for you. Um, at that point, the, the, estimate, the estimator staff is then supposed to um, compare that to the pencil estimate. The pencil estimate makes sure they're roughly the same and then uh, submit it on down the line. After it's done, Progress estimate creates a custom print similar to what we've seen again out of PPT or uh, out of our estimate or out of our uh, estimate software for you know 15 years, 10, 15 years, something like that. So again, the idea with this isn't that yes, this is a new application. You're seeing it, you're entering it differently, but we want the end result to look exactly like what these folks have seen day in and day out for you know the, the entire time they've been with Dell Dot. So they're not having to relearn or learn something new. And this is probably one of our more complicated workflows that we have. We've got a couple of decision processes that happen and, and some alternate routes that you can go through on this one. But the idea is that it's very flexible in what we can do and how we you know, set everything up. 
progress meeting minutes. This was um, this is one that's not used a lot right now. I, I foresee it eventually um, being used a little more often. This progress meeting minutes business process actually allows you to create the agenda for your first progress meeting minute or first progress meeting. Send it out for review. Everybody gets a chance to look at it. Um, that gives them the actual agenda for what the meeting is. And then when you get into the very next step in the workflow, it allows you to take the minutes in the, the uh, in the in Unifier. And then based on what you select, when you create your next progress meeting minute record, it'll automatically build your agenda based on what you selected in your first meeting minute. So if you have items that are carrying over from, from month to month or bi week to bi week, however, you all, however often you're having your uh, progress meetings, it automatically does that for you. So you don't have to consistently retype that agenda or you're not modifying a Word file. It's all right there in front of you. This is an example of what it would look like. Again, I, I know the text is kind of small, but um, it's got a lot of information in it. So your, your RFI log, your shop drawing, source supply, everything you would typically talk about at a progress meeting is right here in Unifier. Um, you're adding business items, so environmental, in this case, project CPM schedule, roadway, roadway lighting. All that information is here. You're typing it in and then here whether or not, and it's kind of hard to see, but that column right there is further action required if that's set to yes. When you create your next record, it will automatically pull those items in to create your agenda for the next, the next, uh, the next meeting. So this is, an, this is a kind of an example of what that progress meeting line item looks like. This is for a project CPM schedule. You can see that the uh, construction field staff has set this one up and, and just kind of typed in what the information is. This is just a list of attendees, just to give you an idea, kind of a CC list, who showed up to the meeting. And then at the end, it actually creates your minutes for you in a PDF format. Um, you can, when you create these, change this to a Word format, so if you need to edit something or something just doesn't show up right, um, you can make small changes. It doesn't store that change that you make, uh, but it does give you some flexibility. And then this is the workflow, like I said. So it starts off from creation, goes to agenda distribution, then you get into the recording phase where you're actually taking your minutes, it goes to review. Um, so somebody can just make sure that the minutes that you took are what they are, are uh, expecting, and then it goes to an approval status, and then when it goes to end, it sends it out to everybody that attended that meeting automatically. Uh, to give you some ideas, some, some of the reports that we're creating using our inspector daily report information, this is an estimate worksheet. So you run the custom print or custom report. You say from this date to this date, show me every item uh, that, was, that was in those IDRs. It prints it out for you, uh, and it literally takes two minutes at most. Uh, here's another one. This is a summary over on underrun. So this is a running list of every day that an item is on an IDR, what the quantity was, compares it to your contract quantity. In this case, you can see that overrun column is red. That means you've overrun that quantity, and it gives construction field staff the ability to quickly see whether or not a change order needs to happen. Um, and it does track both inspector daily reports and any time you do a quantity adjustment. So you can see right there, it looks like there were some changes that needed to be made on this particular item. Um, and it brought it back to within, uh, to no longer being overrun. Some additional things. So uh, our intention for the spring of 2020. So we'd like to get an updated request for information and submittal process out. Um, these two business processes right now are run 100% by our construction staff. So that requires them to get in and manually put in information that they're being given from the contractor. And instead what we want is we want the contractor logging into Unifier uh, they're already logging in now to, to approve progress estimates. So we want them logging into Unifier, starting the RFI process in Unifier, submitting it through, and then uh, come to the area engineer or to the construction field staff, where then it'll be distributed, again, within Unifier to the design section, to materials, to traffic, to those, those sections that are required to respond to RFIs, and the same thing for submittals. We'd like to have that out before, uh, before the spring start up again. Not that we had a winter shutdown. The weather's been great. Um, the other thing is general notices. So right now we don't have a way to track uh, or to, to create the letters for notice to proceed, first chargeable day. We're not doing that in Unifier yet. We want to do that in Unifier. The other thing is doing time suspension and resumption so that um, we don't con continuously just calculate time. For those of you using Unifier, you know that the uh, IDR just kind of counts down days every time you run a new IDR. In this case, we want to be able to suspend time uh, if, if needed. Subcontractor approvals right now, anytime a new subcontractor is needed, they have to contact my office. We have to manually add them for them. We want the subcontractor approval process to start 
Um, again, the idea with this is start with the contractor, let the contractor submit it, contractor gets it in, construction field staff gets it, does what they need to do with it, approves it, sends it on to, you know, follow right on down the step. And then the idea is then that, that subcontractor will be on the project, no need to have uh, my staff involved at all. Um, you heard Ting earlier, we talked about, the, she talked about the ENS weekly and rainfall event site inspection. Um, that form right now, that's a PDF form. Uh, we are in the middle of putting that in Unifier. That's something they've asked, and we're going to be piloting that sometime in the very near future. Um, so, so the idea being that the field staff are, can stay right in Unifier and not have to be worrying about jumping between different forms or different applications, that kind of stuff. We want it right there. Um, we're going to pilot the environmental permit request um, application that's right now is in Maximo. We're going to show them what it can do if it was in Unifier and see if that's something that they're interested in moving to. Um, we're really close to finishing that one. And then the last thing is project funding increase request. That form that everybody has to do now, every time you need a few extra dollars on your project, that's done by PDF, emailing it around. We want this to be in Unifier as well. So as you can see, I've talked a lot about construction, but now we're getting into things that aren't necessarily, number one, not, maybe not in the construction phase, but maybe not even construction related. Um, and, and that's what we see for the future of Unifier. That's what we see. We see it being more of a um, a, a process control type of application that can help the department with tracking where things are specifically throughout the process. Um, starting in the summer of 2020 through the end of 2020 or the spring of 2021, uh, we want to add a pre-construction meeting minutes business process. Uh, this is going to be very similar to what you saw with the progress meeting and it's going to give us some additional information related to NTP and first chargeable day that we'll use in the general notices business process. Um, the PNR process right now, which is a manual process using email, manually using P6, um, we have the ability to integrate Unifier and P6 together. So if we start the PNR process in Unifier when it's done and finance does what they need it to do, um, or does what they need in the PNR process, it will create a project in P6 for you using Unifier. So no more having to remember or go through a PDF. You simply just look through the form, fill out what you need, click next, submit it, and it comes to our office to look at. So it kind of takes what's really right now kind of, I don't want to say a painful manual process, but a process that is um, sometimes not done to, to the, the cleanest and I think really cleans it up and then allows us to integrate P6 and Unifier. Plus it gets the project in during design into Unifier. Right now we don't typically see a project in Unifier until after award um, is, is when we see them. So we want to get in it earlier. That gives us the ability to have some of our support sections that have been asking for integrations in Unifier to work. Um, the non-construction related NTP, so the stuff that uh, Christine Levely's group in contract administration, we've been in talks with them to potentially use Unifier for some of their stuff. They're looking for something. Right now they have, I believe, like one or two Excel files that seven or eight people use. So as you all know, when you open an Excel file, it's locked. You can't open it to do anything with it. If somebody goes on vacation, now you're copying that Excel file to a new Excel file, and then you're hoping that you remember to copy it back. So they've got some um, some things that they'd like us to look at from that, that process. Plus, it helps us, again, tracking the NTP process, very visible to anybody that uses Unifier. Uh, source document storage and creation, going back to construction again. So uh, source documents is, is right now kind of a painful process in Unifier because we're telling them to store the source document in the inspector daily report. And that can be a little bit of a pain to get to if you're not real familiar with it. So creating an actual... Um, business process that helps with either one, creating source documents or storing source documents and then linking them to the IDR is important for us. Um, all of the new ENS liaison processes, uh, we're looking at putting all that into Unifier. I've got uh, you know, a number of forms that Javier had provided before he left um, that you know, all need to be in Unifier at some point because they're construction related. Um, project closeout, um, many across the department know that project closeouts sometimes on the lower end of our priority or has been in the past, we want to try and find ways to, to allow Unifier to help us with closing our projects out, and that's closing out both funding phases and just the typical audit pro, uh, archiving process when it comes to, comes to our, our projects. And, and there's other things. It seems like every time we turn around, we've got people saying, hey, can Unifier do this? I think our tech and innovations group is, is, um, is starting to buy into it. We've got folks that are, are working with us. Um, on these, and, and it seems like I get phone calls quite a bit, hey, can Unifier do this? To, to the point to where it's almost, I'm a little afraid that I'm over-promising. Absolutely, yes, I can do it. We'll get you in in 10 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's uh, it, but I, I can tell you that, you know, as much as I stand up here to, and tend to tell people what Unifier can do or what it does do, we talk a lot about construction, but this is not an e-construction tool. 
And I can't say it enough, it's not an e-construction tool. When I go to these webinars, or when I go to the Oracle events um, and, and hear what other people are doing, there are, there are uh, Fortune 500 companies using it for human relations stuff, for HR type stuff, or human resources type stuff. There are people using it for um, facilities. The state of Ohio uses it for their entire facilities um, construction, capital construction program. Um, Washington State DOT is using it or is beginning to use it. Um, Puerto Rico is getting ready to use it. We had them in, uh, I guess, in October to talk about uh, you know, what we're doing um, and, and to see what they're doing. So Unifier is being used for more than just e-construction. So if, as we start to see what we can do with it as a department, I think we'll really start to see the real, uh, the real strength of, of what the application can do. That's it. Any questions? All the way in the back. Yeah, so I had an event, uh, I had a, a training class on uh, a couple Fridays ago, and uh, I had, I don't know, I think there was 140 people total that, is, that showed up to the, the two different sessions that we had, and that was probably the number one question. And unfortunately, there's n uh, nothing I can do about that. That is a, so this is a, Unifier is an, an off-the-shelf application, so it's owned by Oracle. There are certain things that are hard-coded into the application. Moving the buttons around like that just, just unfortunately isn't one of them at this point. Um, I can add a step, but then it's there for everybody. So every time, and it's not like a, I can't add like a confirmation button. It would actually be a submit the step. You either send it and it comes back to you and then you say, okay, yeah, I do want to send it. Um, but I can't add like a confirmation, unfortunately, not, not with the way things currently are, currently are right now. All right, thank you. Thanks, Billy. Uh, the next presentation is a little sneak peek of our lessons learned training that's going to be on March 10th. And uh, Mark and I are going to uh, be given this presentation. So uh, just to give you a little bit background. Um, so we, we decided to, uh, goodness, almost a year ago, we wanted to hold uh, maybe um, instead of doing something in this forum, we wanted to do something a little bit more in depth and kind of go over what we keep on seeing in some inspections and also um, some other issues that we wanted to, or I should say challenges, that we wanted to uh, look at. So before I start, I just want to say that um, thank you, AJ, because I totally got your, um, your layout for, for the presentation from what you did for Nicole the other week, so thank you. Okay, so again, um, I, liked, I like to uh, also use this because uh, Rob and I were on the committee to actually uh, come up with our mission statement. Goodness, I think it was 10 years ago, so um, I, just, I also like to put it up there too. Okay, so our format for this is, again, it's, it's Tuesday, March 10th. It's a one-day format. Um, I'm going to talk about our, ta our target audience, where uh, Mark and I are going to talk about some focus topics and also the goals of the workshop. So uh, we're going to split it out from the AM uh, to do a, a brief um, overview, again, of the DOTS reorganization. We're going to talk about some guardrail um, issues again, and some ENS um, lessons, and then we're going to do some lunch. And then in the PM, we're going to talk about ADA and uh, another uh, little brief um, overview of our specs, uh, some structability issues, and then um, our new inspection framework. And today at the end of the presentation, Jim's going to come up and talk uh, a little bit about that. All right, so our tar target audience is uh, DOTS Construction, also our MNO contract, contract group in public work. So it's inspectors and house consultants, engineers, and everyone in between. 
So some of the things we'll talk about with the guardrail, we, we see issues on projects and um, want to just sort of talk about some of the common issues we see. Uh, how to handle those conflicts with the standard details. Sometimes the plans may say one thing, they may conflict with our standard details. Um, we want to take the frustration out of it, really um, get people to talk more with the, with the engineer on record. Uh, we'll talk about the added tools and the standard details uh, and what to look for with the MASH updates. We'll get, maybe get a little more in depth. Uh, some examples of improper installation systems. These are the type of things we'll talk about. Um, Maybe you go on a job and you start installing guardrail and you say we should probably extend this thing a little bit further. Um, or you look at, I think the design on the right is the one maintenance legs because you don't have really have to ever replace the impact head of this one. <laughs> um, some other issues, like is there a larger issue we're missing with this guardrail installation? I slap a sign on it, we're good. So this one's actually in Delaware, uh, right down the road. Um, but just common things we'll look at. Again, it's not about frustrating anybody. It's about education and bringing everybody on the same page and increasing communication with everyone between sections. All right. Um, Ting and John talked a, a little bit about what we're doing with the SWIP track, but uh, we're just going to go over some of the basics. Uh, again, reviewing Delaware law and regulations and what it means to be a delegation agency. Some uh, top issues that get us in trouble, um, some good examples and not so great examples, and the consequences for us and the contractors. So uh, I asked Mary Hamilton to give to give us like a, a top ten. So she had six, but then there were goodness probably like twenty issues in between. So we just um, so these are kind of like our top six issues that get us in TRU. T-R-O-U-B-L-E, if I can spell. Um, stabilization, as you can see with the picture right there. Pollution prevention, maintaining um, the BMP, sediment discharges, keeping the, the plan current, you know your red lines, and also notifications. So I'm not quite sure if this picture's in Delaware, but as you can see, this, these are some of the things that can get us in trouble. So we're gonna be going over some of those. And with, with anything, we also got to, to highlight some of the good examples of what we do well. And uh, so these are, are some of the ones that are good examples. You want me to do this one too? Sure. So some of the ADA issues you may run across on construction projects, really want to look at their drainage, uh, the direction of flow when you build, this ramp, build the ramps. Uh, talk about some of the vertical differences, some of the tolerances that we have. Um, some things you could do to maybe improve uh, the surrounding area of that uh, curb ramp. So you, when you build these, uh, build the ramps, you also want to look at what the surrounding hazards. Uh, make sure there's clear accessibility for pedestrians, um, for the disabled. Um, smart, uh, smart levels. By the bane of our existence, right? So we used to be able to, before smart levels, put your tape measure up, level, eh, it looks pretty good. So now smart levels, they give us an accuracy like to a hundredth, um, which creates some frustration, but also uh, we can talk about some of the tolerances that we have. Uh, really, you wanna make sure that you use these um, to our uh, best ability, and they, they can, they've really been a big help. So uh, some of the stuff that Oz already talked about, uh, the 2020 specifications update, so just like a, a, a quick review, it's uh, written to the contractor, passive voice removed, replaced with active imperative mode, improved readability, and uh, we did a whole lot of, of formatting and restructuring. So, um, I don't know, do you wanna take the first three and I'll take the second three? Sure. sure. And I, I just put this little meme in here because I thought it was funny. So utility adjustments, we all know sometimes you get into, you may need to adjust the utility and it's utility specific. They need to use their own people. Uh, talk about, you know, um, what path we can go through our workflow in order to get those done. Uh, again, the, the guardrail constructability issues. Um, we're just gonna try and get in front of guardrail problems and get them designed a little bit, um, not better, but um, a little more towards our standard details so we were all on the same page. 
um, constructability issues with PCC curb, uh, drainage inlet stitching, and uh, sign sleeves. Sign sleeves is something that's just every single project when they go to do the review, you, you see the stubs sticking up a little bit too high. Um, really want to make sure that they're down, um, not flush, but just sticking up a couple inches off of the pavement. Uh, fire hydrants, um, there's you, <clears throat> water valves. Want to make sure we grade around them properly. They're not sticking up. Make sure there's pl plenty of clearance around the fire hydrant. Um, this, these are really critical to help our uh, first responders. Uh, again, the grading around the end treatments. Uh, make sure we fill it in around the signposts. Uh, cracks in the sidewalk. You see this is our typical um, not Jaring Ginlet, but curb opening detail underneath the sidewalk. Uh, we want to make sure that these are, are clear and that uh, um, there's still enough sidewalk for pedestrians to get around or get over top of it. Make sure you parge the inside of the inlets uh, when the pipes come in. I know this is like a last thing that we end up doing is the contractor really doesn't want to do it and most of the time they go miss. But when we go to do these final inspector, semi-final inspections, we want to make sure we catch these so that way they don't make it the final. Um, that and the, the flow channels, make sure the flow channels are poured in all the inlets. Grading around the end treatments, we want to make sure we're not trapping water. Uh, the grading for these is very specific. Um, so as long as we design them right with drainage falling away from the end treatment, um, we want to make sure we construct them that way as well. And here's your Telspar, two and a half inch square tubing, um, showing that it's a one to four inch max on the sleeve height. As you can see, some of these we end up, it may stick up a little bit further. That these are good pictures. Okay. Maureen said these are really good pictures. Uh, the <laughs> So these ones are, we wanted to also show some good examples. So this one was a good example of a, a paving project and also of correct uh, sign installations and PCC curbing. And then again with your, uh, your ditching and um, also ditching into the inlet because that's always a big problem. And then, um, again, this, I guess these are more ditching pictures. I, I guess I got a little crazy. And then also with a, um, a guardrail installation with the end treatment. Now, uh, Jim's gonna come up real quick and talk about uh, the new inspection framework. And then uh, we'll take some questions and comments. But before he comes up, I just wanted to say the road to success is always under construction because we're always finding new and better ways to improve our processes. So one of the things that uh, Billy mentioned was uh, improving our timeliness in closing out projects. And one of the keys to that is the uh, inspe final inspection process. So about a year ago, and Rob, Rob may remember this, uh, back when Rob and Mark Alexander were both still with the department, we started talking about looking at a new way of uh, trying to expedite the uh, inspection process um, and expediting the acceptance of the project. So there will be a memo that will be coming out very soon. Um, that will highlight this uh, or go into more detail. But um, basically what we're um, going to do is uh, instead of the old terms of semifinal and final inspection, we have new terms. Um, it's going to be called an initial inspection and a primary inspection. Basically an initial inspection is going to be the construction team and the contractor going through and basically documenting things that may need to be addressed per the plans and specs. And then the big ask for a lot of people in the room uh, here now is the primary inspection is where we want the design team, maintenance and operations, bridge, et cetera, to be at that inspection so that when Jansen from uh, Maureen's team, when they're out there and doing the inspections, a lot of times there are questions that come up when they're out there in the inspection and they have to come back in the office and get those questions answered and that usually does not or usually is not a very quick time process. So we want the designers to actually be out on the inspection so that questions can get discussed right there, right then, and the decisions are made to say, yes, this was done properly, or no, this wasn't, but here's the reasons why. Um, 
once that takes place, the construction division or the administering division, if it's a maintenance and operations project, um, they will generate a, basically the punch list is gonna get generated there. Um, the folks who are there at the inspection will be able to say, yep, I agree with that, that, that was my question, and there will be no more um, back and forth at that. One other thing is that if you have a project that you know an inspection is coming up and it's gonna be on you know, March 15th or whatever, and you're like, I'm gonna be you know, away or whatever reason, we want your comments before the inspection. So basically, you go out there to the site in advance, you provide any comments that you may have, and you get that to the administering section, and then it will get included in the basically the final punch list. One of the concerns that came up, and this came through the contracting community, is they were getting three and four times, three or four different lists from different inspections that took place. And I think we can all say that there's probably a better way that we can do this. So uh, this new inspection framework will hopefully consolidate that. Um, we still want everybody's input. We need everybody's input. But there are going to be specific time frames that are going to be associated with this. And basically, if you don't speak before that certain time frame, you can't come in you know, a month later and say, well, I rode through that project, and I think you should do x, y, or z. Sorry, you're kind of out of luck at that point. Most folks, you got the plans when they were in review stage. You could have looked at it then. And other than paving rehabs, most of our projects are not done that quickly. So you have plenty of opportunity to provide any comments or concerns or questions that you may have. So there will still be ample opportunities for people to pro provide comments. This is basically putting time frame, specific time frames. So it's basically putting time frames on us as a department, not only to get communicate to the contractors, but also to, again to move the acceptance of these projects. So. Um, again, memo will be coming out maybe this week. It's already been signed, so maybe this week it'll be in your inboxes that it will have more specifics on it, but uh, we just wanted to take this opportunity to give everybody a heads up about it. Once you see it, um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Maureen and her team um, and answer any questions. I also want to thank Mark and Maureen and their teams. Um, this document you're going to see, like I said, it started with when Rob was here, so it's about a year and a half uh, old document. We want to hear your comments and feedback um, because it can be changed if need be, um, but we just need to get it out in the field and run it through its paces because honestly, I'm tired of looking at the damn thing, so I wanted to get it out. <laughs> so, any general questions about what we're doing with that? Just take that that you guys got no questions for Mark or myself. Um, so we're going to have break. What time is it? It is uh, about eight of two, and uh, so we'll take a, a twenty-minute break and come back at twelve or two twelve. Oh, picture, picture for all the presenters. If you're still here, please come up here. Shante wants to get a picture. If we can do it real quick right now, we'll be out of your hair. Oh. And a reminder, the trash at your tables, please put them in the trash receptacles. I am not your maid. I got three kids at home, and one is my husband.
Is Ting still here? Ting, are you still here? Please come to the front.
just a few things as we come back to our seats. Uh, I know you guys still have about five minutes, but uh, again, if you didn't sign in, please sign in for the PM session. Also, uh, there will be a link to a survey that if you want your PDH credits, you will have to fill out. And that'll be uh, sent to you um, in the next day or two. And we are on there will be a deadline and we're, we're going to have it for Friday, February 28th by noon. All right, final call to get last minute snacks, drinks, use the facilities, finish your phone calls, sign into the PM session. And since you guys are all chatty Cathy's, I hope you heard me about the PDHs and filling out the survey. Oh, that got you all quiet. Okay, so no fill out survey, no PDHs. So you will get a link in the next day or two to fill that out. We're asking you to fill it out by next Friday, the 28th, by noon. Everything will be uh, sent out in the email forthcoming. Um, oh, good. All right. So I guess we'll start a little early. Sorry, I lied. So I guess we're starting three minutes earlier than what I originally said. Um, all right, so our next presentation is about drones. Uh, they're going to talk about an overview of the program, number of licensed pilots, what they're doing with it. So Mark and Dave Grohl, I mean, Sean Armstrong are going to be up here talking about, um, about drones. Thank you, Maureen. So Sean and I are going to talk about the drone use in the department. No, it's not Delta, it's Space Force. Uh, but we're, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. We're trying to get, see more of uh, what, what it can do for us and, and integrate it more into what we do. Uh, Dan Thompson, this is one of the flights he took for traffic incident management. This is a fatality at US uh, 13 Redden Road. Uh, you can take his, his drone up. You can look at the MOT that's taking place. Uh, we had a, a fatality at 495 and DSP called TMC and ask them to bring their drone crew up just because they can fly the fatality, uh, get their shots a lot quicker, and we could clear 495 a lot faster. So it really worked well, uh, integrating a lot of what we do with DSP. Special events, this is a photograph Alistair's crew took. He came, comes up to help us. Uh, one of the control points for Firefly 2019. What we could do with these is we could take uh, photographs of the setup 
and then the next year catalog everything and hand that to the supervisors at those locations, basically say, make it look like this. So it's really been a huge plus for us. We also use the drones to sort of track parking lot status, how full they're getting. It allows us to make changes a lot quicker, knowing if a lot's gonna fill up, that we can start diverting our MOT items and get, get traffic diverted to another lot. As you can see, Firefly fills up pretty quick, uh, full of a bunch of drunk high kids. Um, so <laughs> you, may, you may think, why is the department involved in special events? Well, the problem is, the first time Firefly came to Delaware, it was gonna be a small concert, maybe a couple campers, but they gridlocked the middle part of Delaware from Dover up to Middletown. So it's a problem. So if the department doesn't handle it, and Mike Rivera runs this program, does a very good job. I didn't put a picture in this year because he made me last year. So, but um, if we're not out there uh, managing these events, we're gonna have gridlock out on our roads. I was able to get a, a drone shot at Craig Stevens working hard, the 150-pound 100, Craig, Craig Stevens, is that what it was? So construction and safety inspection, Dan Thompson flew this for me as well. This is bridge 3-150 down to Rehoboth. As you can see, traffic is contraflowed. This is the CMGC contract. Uh, this is traffic is contraflowed onto the southbound side as they reconstruct northbound. Uh, as flying the drone, you can really pick up how the flow of traffic is running, uh, how things are looking, helps you look at problems you may not be able to see every, uh, when you're on the ground. Uh, I had Dan, Dan was able to fly underneath the bridge 3-150. As you can see, the, the bridge is up, uh, jacked as they worked on, work on the bearing pads. And uh, this is a really difficult fly just because the winds that come under there. So it's real credit to Dan Thompson's ability to fly under here. Um, with this, I'm gonna hand it off to Sean Armstrong. Uh, for me, the secretary challenges us to, to be innovative and using drones, uh, we don't know all the capabilities yet, but we're working through those. And Sean's very passionate about it, so in order to have a progressive, viable program, you really need somebody who's passionate about it, so I'm just thankful Sean's here with us. So I'm going to talk about the regulations and the program that we uh, developed. Uh, Dwayne Day is the head of our program. Um, Nelson uh, Kessler, or K Kessling, I know I just butchered your last name, boss. Um, he has set up uh, the COA for our, our, our drone program, which is a certificate of authorization. This allows us to fly in controlled airspaces like Dover Air Force Base, Newcastle County Air Airspace. Um, some of the other things as we, we fly under 107, everything else for, um, for our drone program uh, with the COA, we also fly under Park 91. So we also have multiple waivers. Uh, we have a, a night waiver that we fly under. We also have, uh, we're working on uh, flying over people waiver is what we're, look, we're looking at. Everything we fly under is uh, DJI products right now. Um, we got 25 pilots. So this is one of our flights at 400 feet. This is our max ceiling that we we're able to fly at. And this is our checklist that we run through before every flight that takes off off the ground. This is the front and back, and this is what we do for everything we're landing. Well, announcing your takeoff, landing, securing the area. Uh, with our program, Dwayne Day brings in a lot of training for us, night uh, flying training. Uh, we've also done uh, hazmat training as well. Uh, they've developed a course in one of their garages where we fly through different obstacle courses. Uh, these are industrial fans in the middle here that we fly through and check out and see what's in the buckets. Um, this makes us better at flying for different predicaments. Here's our drone bus. We usually take this to uh, most of our events. Uh, we are able to stream to our drone bus and our bu drone bus is able to stream directly into our TMC. We also, um, actually South District has a gator that helps them get into tighter spaces. Um, we do also uh, the Harrington uh, Fair, and they are able to bob and weave into the fair a little bit to fly and uh, just kind of check out everything that's going on. That also has the same capability as well. This is one of our flights. We kind of flag off the area we take off in. We're actually in a construction zone, so we're also got cones around everything that we're flying. All right, next is uh, construction and survey. 
um, survey. We're trying to integrate drones into both of these. Uh, this image here is photogrammetry we did on Brownsville Road. Um, it came out really good looking. Um, we did notice some distortion on some of the pipes there, and that's just because of the triangulation of an image. And that's what photogrammetry is. It takes uh, images and finds multiple mat match points within the image to triangulate uh, kind of like a coordinate grid system on the ground. Here's our ground control points. Uh, we do uh, Tyvek ground control points and we also do painted ground control points. Uh, the reason why we did it like this because it minimizes cost. I was actually able to fly this job site three or four times, excuse me, off the same ground control points that I put out there. So we kind of just leave them set until we have to actually leave off the job site. Oh, here's the stencil, by the way, for the ground control points right up front here. Um, what is it? Andy uh, got us in touch with uh, Tim Santaj. Or did I say that wrong, Andy? Sh Shakula. Sorry, sorry, Tim. Sorry, Mr. Shakula. And uh, <laughs> Jimmy Mitchell. They actually cut that out for us with a, a laser, and that, and they got it to our specs and everything. It looks great. Um, this is uh, our flight uh, model that we flew. Uh, every so many feet, it takes a picture, and then it uses all the pictures to triangulate everything. Oh. This is the point cloud that came out with that. That is the same culverts that you were seeing earlier. Um, the problem that we had with this is that it's a very large file to manipulate within MicroStation. We are working on other programs to see what we can use to manipulate this a little bit better. Here's our comparison with, uh, actually it was John Orsinger ran a traditional survey out here, and then we ran the photogrammetry on top of this. They meet up very good. Um, if you look a little closer, well here's a couple of the profiles here. The yellow is actually Orsinger's traditional survey, and the green is the, um, is the photogrammetry. But we had a comparison, we hit 900s, it's plus or minus a 10 throughout the whole job. We had a couple spots that matched up within a hundredth. Um, it's not great for shooting uh, pavement, but we're working out other solutions for that right now. All right, um, this is uh, one of Robbie B Brown's flights, and this was a job that they weren't able to get access into, uh, uh, what is it? it, I think it's historical home is what it was. Um, so this is part of land services. They were able to fly the flight to see that everything was okay with, uh, with the facilities. Also, uh, this is another Robbie Brown flight. Um, they, also, they deal with encampments on state property when we go to build on state property. Um, this helps them give location, documentation, uh, of what's going on with the encampments so they can develop a program to help out the, the people in the encampment. All right, uh, this, is a, uh, this is what I thought was a really cool one. Um, they found an old gas station that they acquired the property for. Uh, the tanks were not documented that they were removed. They turned around and uh, actually flew thermal to document where they were. They were able to find the exact spots where the tanks are at, um, and they were able to properly remove them pretty quickly. We are also doing with thermal is... I know South District is using them during uh, pavement operations, and they're kind of just uh, kind of testing this out right now, and they're using it for bridge deck delaminations to kind of see how all that is uh, structurally built. These are some of the programs we've been running through. Uh, drone deploy, that's where you saw all the pho photogrammetry that I've been using, um, is all from them. Uh, South District has been using uh, PIX4D. Um, we're comparing the photogrammetry, the, the way they compare with each other. Um, we use drone logbook uh, to kind of keep track of all our experience. This way we can kind of, you know, become more experienced pilots and be like, all right, well, I flew 200 hours. I am at this level of experience. Um, drone Sense, this is a new program that they're using for uh, streaming. We were using Captivate before, but Captivate is uh, pulled out. We were able to stream live to the TMC. Now the TMC will be able to see where our drones are located at, our field of view, 
kind of everything that the pilot sees. With Captivate, you didn't get to see that before. So this is a really cool program. I hope to see more about it and what they're doing. Oh, this is the best part right here. This is the reason why I'm doing this presentation. <laughs> right, here we go. We're trying to talk Mark Buckaloo to pay for this bad boy here. <laughs> Uh, this is the LiDAR drone. <laughs> this is the LiDAR drone. Um, it pretty much is a scanner on a drone is what it is. Um, the data acquisition is amazing. This thing gets 500,000 shots a second. Okay, you can pick up the details and signs, all kinds of stuff. Um, the one here, the big picture is what um, Utah is using. It's a yellow scan on a Matrice 600. Um, the white one in the top corner is an MD 3000, and that is what uh, North Carolina was looking to acquire. The one in the bottom, that's my wish list right there. That is a Regal sensor. Regal is the top LiDAR um, company out there that I've seen so far. Um, it's a pretty penny to pay for this thing, but the data acquisition is amazing. You have multiple purposes for it. Uh, these are actually what the sensors look like. Um, that's the yellow scan and these are the two regals. Uh, I heard somebody said that they had somebody drive with the LiDAR scanner sensor on. Um, that bottom corner is interchangeable from the drone to a vehicle. I've actually even seen it go, Amtrak uses it as well. This is a, a data acquisition. This is not our data acquisition. But this is an example of the detail that you would uh, I would be able to provide if we were able to fly LiDAR. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, I did pretty good on this presentation to get this. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I'm going to let Mark close it out, so. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sean. If I could just back up to one, we did Westover Connector, we actually had a conflict with the aerial lines and as far as getting a shot on those aerial lines in a horizontal location, it was very difficult. I mean, we could put a stick up to find the line. So it, we had to drive piles underneath of it. By having uh, drone use and surveying things, we can actually get a, an elevation or horizontal alignment of the actual aerial line. So um, it's just an increased capability that we have with the drones. Uh, I'm going to close out with this video. Hopefully it'll play. <laughs> Uh, video. I, I asked Sean Armstrong to go up and sh and shoot Martian Car, just because it's a project that's had its problems, um, uh, a lot of unforeseen conditions. So I asked him to go up and fly. We recently had a traffic shift up there. We're running contra flow, as you can see, traffic's running on the southbound side, uh, northbound and southbound's running on the southbound side. While we reconstruct northbound. Uh, his drone footage is really phenomenal and it shows really a fantastic job they're doing up there, even though we're, we're behind schedule and I know the problems we have. Uh, but you really see the ENS control, it's really in good shape. Uh, temporary pedestrian pathways, Jerry, it's in place. You can see it in the drone shot. Uh, and I thank Sean for really taking this shot because it, it's really good video and it really shows the excellent work that we're doing up there. So I'll let this run if anybody has any questions. Yes, Javier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Hob, and thanks for coming back. So if I can actually piggyback on that, Dan, Dan Montag is, is really one of the um, head people taught for the country for FHWA with drone use. So uh, he's a fantastic resource for us. Uh, we'll be talking more with Dan as far as the department, what different capabilities we can have. Um, he's sharing with us a lot of the training that's available across the country. Um, so thank you, Dan. Uh, he's a big advocate of using drones. Is there any other questions? Yes. So she asked about the life expectancy, as long as DJI will support it. So that's what we usually run. So there's a couple of drones that are out there, like the, the Phantom 3, that they haven't supported that for years. If you fly something like that, you can kind of get yourself in a risky business there. So we, that's what it is, as long as I can get maintenance for it. Yep. So I just want to say, we do have a request form out now that has drone work on it. Uh, you guys can uh, look it up on, uh, I think it's our DTI site. 
and uh, request for some drone work from us. <laughs> yes, in the back. Yes, sir. So I'm looking at processing everything else with uh, eventually the LIDAR stuff is processed with ground control points and PPK, which is a post-process kinetic. That's why it's uh, pushing the LIDAR, that, that's, Bruce. That's where, <laughs> and, and it's because it shoots the same way a GPS does. It shoots from above, nothing is coming out from below it, and that's what you're always going to get that answer, plus or minus a tenth, because it's the same setup. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. And that's funny you say that. We actually did that in the process for the photogrammetry. We shot it off the original control. I actually did a setup where I can prove that my survey was good. So, because I worked for a company that did this before. And so the thing is, we always had the, the guys that fly tell us that we were wrong. So I set it up where I shot it at two different heights so they, can dis they couldn't disprove the heights. And it came off the design control. And that's what we're comparing it to, is what is done on site to on site. Yeah. Have the drones been used for uh, locating ITMS cameras, the different views that you would get at a certain elevation if you're looking for a design aspect of it? Um, I don't know that one. Yeah, some, some states have done that where they, they know they want to think they know they want to have a pole, yeah. take the drone, and then the, the guys who want to see it, hey, move it 100 feet this way, other side of the road, and they can get the correct height, elevation, offset so they can see exactly what they want. If you want to put in a request for that too, we can do that as well. <laughs> See, and that's the one thing about drone work is that it is an open aspect. I can use it for everything. Someone get that man a LIDAR drone, please. <laughs> All right, someone stole my pen. Mark, did you steal my pen? <laughs> I do appreciate you mentioning e and All right, uh, we have come to our, our last presentation, and it's a good one. And it is Cooperative Automated Transportation, and Veronica Vanderpool is here to present on that. Hi, everybody. So I'm coming into this presentation with a few strikes against me. We've been sitting here for six and a half hours, and I am the 18th speaker. I am the last speaker of the day. I am talking about a new section called CATS, which many of us know nothing about. I'm talking about technology that at our very best we're skeptical of and at our worst we're suspicious of. I recently hired someone from Dell Dot Planning, Nate Tard, to my team, so that's another strike. And then lastly, all of you are wondering, who is she? <laughs> so just some brief background. My name is Veronica Vanterpool. Yes, I am from New York, if you have not noticed, from what people tell me is an accent. I come from many years of transportation, advocacy, and policy in all areas of transportation. I am a transit geek and nerd. I wonk out on all sorts of on-time performance and mean distance between failures. That is my background. I am delighted to be here in Delaware to talk about innovation and to work with all of you on what innovation means for this state. 
what do I press? <laughs> That's not very innovative, right? I'm not, I'm not sending off a good impression here. Oh, is it this, Maureen? Yeah. All right. And it's... That's the big one. Ah, okay. And then you need to go back there. That's the pointer. Great. Thank you. So this is a write-up of the CATS section, the Cooperative Automated Transportation section. There's just a few words that you really need to tune into. It's new. It's a new approach. It's a new way of thinking about mobility. Secretary Cohen started her remarks by talking about the future of transportation, and she highlighted the autonomous vehicles that we're going to talk a little bit about. It's really about thinking of the next generation of transportation strategies. Many of us have been involved in this work for a long time. And what's old is now new again. And what's new might be old. So it's just thinking about how are we strategizing? What's our, our, our forward thinking approach here? It's about integration. You see it's cooperative. How are we working together? How are we integrating all of our practices, all of our strategies, all of our technologies, and moving forward to this new era of mobility? We're thinking about safe and multimodal transportation networks for all users of our road network. Our drivers, those who are walking, those who are rolling, those who are scooting, those who are taking transit, those who are biking. We need to start thinking about the integration, and many of us are working on this already in this new era of mobility. Piloting, we're thinking about what are, we, what are the emergent technologies? What are, we, what are we putting forward? What are we testing? What are we trying? What is new? Emerging technology, we've heard a good deal about that today. We want to be at the forefront. Delaware needs to be at the forefront. And we need to be an incubator of good ideas, the same way I and you all are talking about what cities in Utah are doing what cities in California are doing. I want people, and you all want people, talking about what we are doing here in Delaware. So CATS includes connected and autonomous vehicles. Basically, this is technology that allows infrastructure and people and vehicles to communicate. They're talking to each other. They're using Wi-Fi. They're using LTE. They're using cell cellular data and satellites to say, hey, there's all this different activity in our road network. How are we integrating together? How are we working together? How are all these different modes balancing against each other? What's the point of this? The point is to supply useful data and information so that we, as users of our road network and our transportation network, are making informed and better decisions. CAV is also about collecting data and transmitting traffic and road conditions from every major road within the transportation network. And why is that important? We know why. It helps with our decision making. It helps with our planning. It helps with traffic management. It helps with congestion relief. It helps with investment in our infrastructure. When we are thinking about the future of mobility and the future of transportation, it's, again, thinking, how are we cooperating? What are our connected and autonomous approaches to everything that we see around us? So there's some clear benefits of CAV. All of us in this room know that there are nearly 37,000 traffic fatalities every single year from about 6 million traffic crashes. In Delaware alone, the secretary has been very clear that there has been a concern and a challenge with regards to traffic fatalities, an increase of 19% in 19, 2019 over 2018. That means that pedestrian deaths have risen from 30 to 30 from 24. These are numbers that you all know. These are numbers that many of you are working in your day-to-day -day activities to mitigate and address. So CAV has the potential to eliminate about 80% of these unimpaired crash scenarios. In fact, NHTSA identifies or notes that 94% of traffic crashes are a result of human error. So this is the part where a lot of people are skeptical or suspicious of this technology because we still understand that this is a nascent technology in many ways. And there's still a lot of data that we have to collect. But this is one tool, CAV is one tool in a toolbox. It is not the only strategy. I heard someone the other day say, shuttles are going to replace all the cars. No, they're not going to replace all the cars. 
but it is a strategy to achieve safety. There's another benefit of reduced traffic congestion. There is a substantial reduction in travel time delays caused by congestion when you're using connected and autonomous technology. It can allow vehicles to drive closer together, increasing roadway capacity without actually adding vehicle lane miles. Many of you might be familiar with the exclusive bus lane into the Lincoln Tunnel from the New Jersey Turnpike, one of the most efficient uses of roadway. 1,800 buses travel in a four-hour window, transporting 70,000 passengers. Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is looking at this technology, connected and autonomous technology, to see how they can platoon buses closer together to add 200 more buses, 10,000 more passengers without adding additional vehicle lane miles, more lanes, and a very congested transportation network. That is innovation. Another benefit is real-time information. Cars and bicyclists, pedestrians, anyone with a cell phone can provide relevant data to DelDot, including speed, weather, traffic congestion, um, and road conditions. And cities are exploring this technology in order to move, uh, in order to optimize the movement on city streets. Um, cities such as New York City are looking at ways of having traffic signals respond to pedestrian load at certain intersections. So that way they're moving cars and people and buses along a lot more efficiently just using this real-time data. Another benefit is providing priority for our emergency vehicles. We're allowing our vehicles to respond more quickly and under easier road conditions, as opposed to just merging into uh, a traffic situation that may not be safe for anyone. And we're talking about decreased response times. So those are just some benefits of connected and autonomous technology. Many of you are working on this. It's not unfamiliar to you. So now we're looking at our shuttles. And the secretary opens with these two very exciting pictures of George and Jane. So 58 years ago, the Jetsons hit TV for one year. For one year, that show was on. And everybody's talking about it in pop culture, 58 years ago. And interestingly, the promotional materials for the Jetsons projected a transportation future 100 years into the future. So the Jetsons was talking about 2062. So we're not there yet. But we're a lot closer than we were 58 years ago when the Jensen's got on TV. So let's talk a little bit about this AV tech and how it works. So we've heard a good deal about LiDAR, light detection and ranging. And LiDAR is not new technology. In fact, it was first used about 90 years ago in the 1930s when scientists were trying to measure the composition of the atmosphere using laser beams. And then it was later used again in 1962 when MIT scientists were trying to measure the distance between the Earth and the Moon. 1971, Apollo 15 astronauts were using LIDAR to map the surface of the Moon. And today, LIDAR is used by NOAA, USGS, NASA. We hear about LIDAR in our pavements and in our asset inventory program. What LiDAR does is create this amazing 3D map. It's different than a two-dimensional picture that many of us have been relying on. It is collecting millions of data points and creating this real-time map that is much more easily uploaded that we can then use. It is firing all these invisible laser beams from one spot to another and collecting information on the distance between point A and point B very similar to sonar or to radar, LIDAR is helping us map our world. It's collecting millions of points about other vehicles, how other users of the road are getting around, pedestrians on their cell phones, for example, bicyclists that are using GPS to get around, those who are in wheelchairs. It's collecting information on traffic and weather conditions. We're familiar with LIDAR in a lot of other ways, too. Ray, uh, speed guns are actually, or handheld speed guns, use LiDAR technology. So 
So I want to just show you a very short video, it's less than two minutes, about the very ex same model of autonomous shuttles that we have. The manufacturer is Easy Mile. They are from France. They were delivered in December. And if you'll all just watch this, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to deploy our shuttles. This is the EZ-10, running on Easy Mile proven technology. It is the most deployed autonomous shuttle in the world. Driverless and 100% electric, it carries up to 15 people. Already in operation in mixed traffic environments, it bridges the gap between existing transport services and offers local mobility, both in city centers and on campuses. The EZ-10 doesn't need infrastructure. It follows predefined routes or works on demand via an app. It detects and avoids potential obstacles thanks to a full set of sensors. Lighters, cameras, GPS, odometry, inertial measurement unit. Easy access thanks to an automatic inbuilt wheelchair ramp. Vehicle to infrastructure communication. The EZ10 works with the vehicle agnostic fleet management Easy Fleet software for mission management and route optimization. The EZ10 shared autonomous shuttle, the efficient driverless transportation solution for urban environments, rural areas, or private sites. Who in the audience has seen the shuttles? <laughs> So our shuttles, they have no steering wheel, they have no pedals, they have no driver's seat. We expect our vehicles to travel somewhere between eight to 12 miles per hour. They're gonna start on the lower end. We are going to start testing them actually uh, in the next few weeks. The engineer is arriving sometime tomorrow to begin with software updates. And we're gonna run them around a closed loop campus on the Danner campus. So many of you are gonna start seeing it. And then after we test it and we understand a little bit more, we expect to move it to another location, very likely Ledge Hall. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in the shuttles. They will always operate with an ambassador slash operator on board who will be trained to take control with like this joystick. It, it really does look like a joystick. I think many of you saw it. There's a strap and it hangs around the neck. And Nate Tard, who I mentioned earlier, he'll be our lead, our chief operator. But it will provide an additional layer of confidence, we hope, and security in this new technology. And we hope to move the shuttles around the state. We, it requires approval from NHTSA before we are able to run it on another loop. And that is a, a process that can take a little bit of time, but certainly doable. We want to have the shuttle do a little bit of a road show around the state. So we're going to be discussing potential locations with others. So Easy Mile operates in 20, in 11 states with 23 vehicles. Delaware has the 22nd and the 23rd. And all these states are looking at this technology, looking at the shuttle for a lot of different ways. They're looking at first and last mile transport. Some of them are researching accessibility for older adults or those who are um, living with disabilities. Some universities are looking at partnerships with transit agencies and getting students to and from. One city is looking at an airport, is, is looking at connecting passengers from an airport to the rental car facility. There's a lot of corporate campus um, road shows with their shuttles. And just to give you a sense of how people are thinking about these and deploying them. So that is just one area of uh, the CATS section. All of you, we ask that you be on the lookout. We want you all to be good ambassadors for this technology. But just one other thing, and I'm just about wrapping up here, is thinking about mobility as a service. And that also falls under um, connected and autonomous technology. It is how do we 
find alternatives to the use of the private car? How do we make it easier for people to find other options other than driving, particularly if we provide those options? So one of the things that the CAT section is going to be looking at is looking at other ways of synthesizing and complementing the transit service that we provide around the state. There are other areas around the state where it may not make sense to deploy a 40 foot vehicle. How can we better serve those communities? And just to give an example of microtransit from some other cities, uh, this is an example from VIA. VIA operates not in Delaware, but in, in some other large cities like New York City. You're downloading an app, you're connecting, and you're getting a virtual bus stop. So VIA is actually crowdsourcing demand from people who want to use another option other than their personal vehicle and sending them to a virtual bus stop and sending them along a corridor to get from destination A to destination B. So to wrap this up, what's the point of all of this? Why are we thinking about the future of mobility? What is the future of transportation? We are living in a state where the demographics are changing very rapidly. The aging population is growing significantly. There's a large number of younger people who want to move here. How are we moving them around? We all recognize the constraints and the limitations of our road network. We can't keep building our way out of that. How are we thinking about sustainability goals and resiliency goals? How are we reducing barriers to access for people who need access to our transportation network for all sorts of connectivity to jobs and recreation and homes and um, connected communities. This is what we are thinking about when we're thinking about the future of mobility and the future of transportation. And technology is one very tool to achieve that. There are so many different tools. We're looking forward to exploring as many of them. And as far as this role of chief innovation officer, people ask me all the time, what is it that you do? And my simple answer is, I'm innovating my job. <laughs> I am innovating my job. I'm listening to you all. I'm learning and I'm taking ideas. So I look forward to engaging with you all as we're on this journey together. Thank you for your time. Just give me like 30 seconds. I just got to uh, thank a lot of people. Uh, first of all, all the presenters, fabulous job. Give a big round of applause. <laughs> also, uh, the engineering support staff, Danny, Bob, Billy, Edna, I mean, Corinne. Um, <laughs> Omar, Maria, uh, Jansen. Oz, I'm probably forgetting someone, Jim, uh, <laughs> and uh, Angela, and um, also Loretta, and sorry, Mark, I did find my pen, so I guess I got to eat those words, uh, but again, thank you so much. Remember to look out for the link to uh, fill out the survey so you can get your PDHs. Let us know what you think about the one-day format. We think it was success. 18 presentations, that's crazy, right? 18 presentations, and we ended early. Um, thank you, guys. Oh, remember your trash. Remember your trash.